A self-watering grow bed is a lazy gardener's dream. It's got a, a layer of soil on the top where you can plant and grow things, but under that is a great big reservoir full of water that automatically wicks the moisture up to the roots. It's an easier, less time-consuming, and more efficient way to water your vegetables. In the spring and fall, I usually fill it up once every week or two, which amounts to just grabbing a hose, putting it in the fill tube, and turning on the water until it's full. Now in the heat of the summer, I sometimes have to fill it like every four days or so, but that's in the very heat of the summer when the plants are really big and using a lot of water. And even then, that's still way easier than moving a sprinkler around, and again, it uses way, way less water, so it's a lot more efficient. I hope that after watching this video that you'll know what you need to know in order to build one of these things, but I want to let you know right up front that I'm not going to provide exact measurements or a cut list, so it's not exactly a step-by-step. -step. When I build things, I tend to do the math in my head as I go along, so I don't end up with any kind of record after the fact. But I'm hoping that by coming along with me, you'll get the hang of it too. And my thinking is that if you already know enough about how to use power tools and that sort of thing, then you'll have the basic skills you need to do your own measurements. And plus, then you'll make it to fit your space. It would be actually kind of silly of me to show you how to make this one that fits my space. The point of this video is more to show you how these things work and how well they work. In the end, you should have the knowledge you need to make your own design or more or less copy mine. I built mine in 2018 and I'm shooting this in March of 24, meaning that they've been working well for about six years without any maintenance whatsoever. So far, so good. The concept is called sub-irrigation, meaning that you're watering the plants from the bottom up. If you've ever owned one of those planters that has like a reservoir in the bottom, then it's the same thing. You fill the reservoir in the bottom and then the water wicks up via what's called capillary action. So there are three basic parts, the soil on the top, the reservoir in the bottom, and then a wick to draw the moisture from one part to the other. There are various opinions about what to use as a wick, and I've even seen people recommending things as diverse as baby diapers, hopefully not used ones. The soil makes a pretty good wick though, so that's what I've been using. And like I said, more or less six years and so far the soil wicks have done fine. I don't honestly know what's in a baby diaper, but for me, I don't really want that in my food. Soil seems to work great. Most garden centers can sell you all you need for a pretty reasonable price. I also add a generous amount of compost every year to keep the soil nutrient rich and healthy. Most compost you buy at the garden center is not quite ready when you buy it, so the compost you buy this year will be bioavailable next year. So use this year's compost as mulch. Speaking of gardening advice, I do want to mention that I am not an expert gardener. You should interpret that to mean that if I can do it, anyone can. After watching many, many, many videos on YouTubes, I did learn about a few things that can go wrong with a sub-irrigated bed. One of them is that you don't want your roots to grow into your reservoir because most plants don't like what's called wet feet. Roots tend to need to breathe a little, and in the natural world, they need to attract tiny organisms to help them absorb minerals and nutrients from the soil. In this system, we want to keep the soil out of the water as much as we reasonably can because it can clog things up. Some YouTubers will tell you it doesn't really matter, while others say it's a pretty big deal. I just went ahead and made my design to reduce the amount of soil in the water. It probably doesn't prevent all of the soil from getting in the water. It's not perfect, but as I've said before, I don't believe in perfection, I believe in joy. Minimizing the soil in the reservoir also increases the amount of water I can get into the reservoir, so it's a good thing to aspire to. And here's something that's kind of unique about this system. When you water a normal grow bed, it gets moist from the top down. In this system, the moistest part is in the bottom and the top is what's dry. So the water doesn't percolate down and that's important to remember. The moist soil on the bottom gets drier as you go up. That makes it extra important to mulch. You really should mulch any garden or grow bed, but with this system, it's especially important. Otherwise, the soil at the top gets really dry and any plants who don't have roots long enough to reach the moisture will not survive. That's especially a bummer with seedlings. Speaking of seedlings, and this is very important, you do need to top water them until they grow some roots. That's usually just a few days. Okay, so we've got our three basic parts, a reservoir at the bottom, soil at the top, and a wick between them. What else? 
Well, you need a way to fill the reservoir. You need a way to check the water level in the reservoir. You need a way to drain the overflow. And if you're like me and you don't like stooping over, you need the bed raised up off the ground a few feet. Lastly, I discovered that I needed a way to keep the squirrels from burying their food in the grow bed because, well, it's a well-known secret. Squirrels are actually assholes. They're very cute, adorable assholes, but make no mistake, they are assholes. One of our squirrels, for some reason, thinks we're buddies and he likes to hang out with me. It's really cute, but then he digs up my garden and also steals the apples off my tree before they ripen. And I'm sorry, but that is total asshole behavior. Okay, but let's see how these things were made. And this is where you're going to get mad at me. I shot this six years ago on my phone. It's pretty rough, and I missed a couple of important shots because at the time, I hadn't even thought about making this channel yet. And I was a little preoccupied at the time with, you know, building the thing. So apologies, but still, I think you will get the information you need. Essentially, it's a box on legs. Simple enough, right? The four legs are a couple of two by fours screwed together, which you'll get a better view of in a minute. I have sometimes used four inch posts, but the two by fours are a lot easier to work with. The sides are fence pickets or slats if you prefer. I call them slats. I use cedar because it's resistant to water and six years later, they're still working pretty well. Redwood also stands up to moisture, but it's sometimes not responsibly harvested. So I default to cedar, which is less expensive anyway. Try to stay away from treated lumber because you don't want those chemicals leaching into your food. Fence pickets are a good shape and size. I just cut them to the length I need, which is about five-ish feet on the long sides and about two or three feet on the short side. Your space might be different, so customize it to your needs, but make sure you don't make them too wide to fit your pond liner, which you'll see in a minute. As you can see, each side has three slats. Like I said before, there's a water reservoir in here, and it comes up about as high as the bottom slat. Then there's a barrier right about here, and from there to the top goes the soil. You'll see all that in more detail in a sec. The most important thing that I did forget to get a shot of is this, the fill tube. It's a two inch PVC tube that goes all the way down to the reservoir. To fill the reservoir is simple enough. I just stick a hose in here and I turn it on until it's full. This is also where I check the water level, which is really easy. I just pop a stick in there and pull it out to see where the water line is, exactly like the dipstick in your car. Simple. How do I know it's full? Well, that's the other thing I didn't get a great picture of when I built them. The drain tube is just a small PVC tube placed right at the top of the reservoir so that when it's full, the extra water drains out here. Sometimes that water is nutrient rich, so I try to catch it with this watering can so I can return those nutrients to the plants. As you can see, I put some caulking around the pipe so that it doesn't leak and stays in place. And that works pretty well, although you can see that I really probably should replace this this year. On the first one of these I built, I skipped this step, so the only way I know the reservoir is full is that the water just starts leaking out. The drain pipe is better. Here's a view of the basic box. I'll show you the underside in a minute, but for now you can see the legs I made from a couple of 2x4s that I just screwed together. I made these four feet high because that's what's comfortable for me, but you could make them any height you want. The floorboards across the bottom are just a bunch of 2x4s running along the width. You'll see what they're attached to in the next shot. I use deck screws for all of this, by the way, and I always drill a pilot hole first. The last thing I want is for the wood to split. The bottom of the box doesn't have to be completely even and perfectly smooth, but you probably don't want gaps in between them where the pond liner could get pushed out and sag. You'll see what I mean when we get to that step. I added some middle pieces on the sides to give the slats something to hold on to. This does need to be really sturdy because it needs to be strong enough to hold a few hundred pounds of water plus the soil plus the plants plus whatever asshole squirrels managed to get in. And their nuts. And their poops. And their 10 pound egos. Squirrels are assholes. Here's the view from the bottom. Now you can see what the floorboard pieces are attached to. Note that the floorboards at each end are about four inches shorter than the rest so as to make room for the legs. Also note that I bolster up all of this with braces. Again, I want this thing to be sturdy. 
All right, going back to the first shot, you might have noticed that I have a sander. That's because our pond liner is going to lie across here and I don't want any splinters poking holes in it, so I sanded this whole area. As an added measure, I also laid a piece of weed barrier cloth, you know, like you get at any garden center, the landscaping cloth, weed barrier, whatever they call it. I laid some across the bottom. Again, that's just to provide a little added protection from hole popping objects. Now we need to size up our pond liner. The pond liner, by the way, is the most expensive part of the whole project, but I didn't skimp on this because the last thing I want is a leak. As I said, my beds are starting their seventh growing season with zero maintenance. Can you imagine getting your plants almost to harvest just to spring a leak? Nope, don't want that. Throw down for what you put down. Now this is one thing that's gonna kinda limit the size of your grow bed. You don't want to make the box too deep for your pond liner. To size it up, I laid the liner across it. As you can see, it's bigger than I needed it to be. In this case, I was fine because I was building two that day. Here it is after I cut it. I have some extra on each side and, and that's what you want. Kind of like a pie crust, right? I have attached it with a staple gun, but only at the top for now. But here's something to remember. As obvious as it might seem, do not put any staples below the water level because they will leak, right? It's kind of hard to see, but for now I only have enough staples in here to roughly hold it in place. We will add more staples later, but that will come up, um, you know, later. Another thing you can't see very well in this pick is that I filled it with about 5 inches of water and then let it sit for a few hours to be extra sure I don't have any leaks. It didn't have any leaks, but if it had, this is one I would want to know about it. Again, can you imagine discovering a leak after it's all built? Ouch. Take the time to test it. Now imagine if, as I said earlier, that I had left gaps in the floorboards. The weight of the water might just have made the pond liner bulge out with the weight. Yeah, maybe you can withstand that, but I'd rather just play it safe because the cost of failure is a bit high. Here's a shot right after I drained that water. Gives you another view of how it's all assembled. At this point, some of the more environmentally conscious folks might be wondering about the impact. All that water, all the rubber, all the PVC tubing, all that wood. Fair enough. Uh, and I applaud your concern, but if you think about how much embedded energy there is in food at the store, this is nothing. It takes about 15 calories of energy to harvest, package, and transport one calorie of food to your table. This will more than pay for itself. But I digress. Next step is I lay some corrugated sewer pipe along the bottom. This will provide structure to hold the soil up above the water, and since it's full of holes, it'll allow the water to flow freely within the reservoir. Notice that there are a couple of vertical pieces. Those are the wicks. I'm going to cover one end with gardening fabric weed barrier stuff, and then I'm going to fill them with soil. I've cut them high enough to reach about the middle of the soil. I want their tops to be up in the soil, but not all the way to the top, just about halfway. Here you can see that I've laid some chicken wire across the top of the sewer pipe. You can also see that the staples I'm using to hold the chicken wire in place are now also holding the pond liner. I told you we were going to do that, so uh, you know, promise kept. Yeah. In this shot, you can see that I've cut a couple holes in the chicken wire. This is where the wick pipes are going to go. Another thing I didn't get a good shot of is that, yeah, as I said, I covered the bottoms of the wick pipes with some weed barrier. The purpose of that is to minimize the amount of soil that leaks out into the reservoir. It won't be perfect, but you know, I don't believe in perfection. I believe in joy. In this shot, you can see that I have installed my imperfect wicks through the holes in the chicken wire. And in this next shot, I have laid a layer of weed barrier on top of the chicken wire that sits on top of the sewer pipe. Between the pipe and the wire and the weed barrier, it manages to hold the weight of the soil and the plants and the asshole squirrels. Going on seven years and still holding up. I tried to be pretty careful to make everything tidy and precise here, again to keep as much separation as possible between the reservoir and the soil. Sadly, this is also where I missed another couple of shots. Remember the fill tube I showed you earlier? Well, you need to cut another smaller hole in the weed barrier in the chicken wire. Make sure it's just big enough to fit a 2-inch PVC pipe, and then that's going to be your fill tube. 
The other thing I missed is that you need to drill a one inch hole in the side of the grow bed and put a small PVC pipe in there to act as your overflow like I showed you earlier. Shame on me. But that is pretty much it. This is a good time to put your grow bed in its permanent home. Do this before you add the soil or the water because those things will make it too heavy to move. Another thing I did before I added the soil was to put this crossbar in. The water and the soil are going to put a lot of outward pressure on the slats, so this is to keep them from bowing out. It seems to work. If nothing else, it gives me a lot of peace of mind. It's super simple, just a one by running down the middle. So far, it's done what it's supposed to do. No bowing. The first time you use it and at the beginning of each season, after you fill the reservoir, you'll also need to top water it to make sure the soil is moist all the way through. After that, it's ready to go. Just about the easiest way to grow food I have ever found. And trust me, I am a really lazy gardener. If I can make this work, anyone can. Oh, and I guess there's one other thing I didn't get a shot of while I was building it, and that's the chicken wire. I have to put it up around the beds because, as I mentioned earlier, yep, squirrels are assholes. They don't really take things out. It's more like they come and bury their nuts in my grow bed, and that is not okay. It is total asshole behavior. I have up till now been able to refrain from using any kind of coarse language in any of my videos, but there's no other word for squirrels. They are assholes. Especially the one who thinks we're friends. His name is Charlie. All squirrels are named Charlie. This particular Charlie is extra asshole. Here's some shots of how well they work. The thing about gardening is that every year is different. Last year was really wet and cool, so I had amazing lettuce. Year before that was really hot, so it bolted before I could eat it. A lot of variables, so I won't make you any promises, but generally, I've had the best luck with beans, radishes, arugula, beets, kohlrabi, and greens. All I can say is that you don't have to remember to water. Oh, and you might have to attach some chicken wire to keep the assholes out. With this video, I'm starting a new playlist called Yardstead, which will be an ongoing vlog about the projects I've taken on to start growing less lawn and more food. Lots more where this came from, and it will be better quality and really fun. But for now, it's time to wrap up this video. Thanks so much for watching. Hope to see you next time. Ciao.